this week on the Rental Report Review. The future is here. Things to come, 1936. When it's after midnight in New York, you don't have to look for love, laughter, and trouble. They'll all find you. After Hours, 1985. A distinguished company breathes life into Shakespeare's lusty age of Falstaff. Chimes at midnight, 1965. At last, it's on the screen. Greater than the stage show. Hell's a Poppin', 1941. Ginshiro threatened to, you know what I'm not gonna tell you what j- just watch this it's a movie about movies and the movie makers that make those movies you'll laugh you'll cry you'll brace in suspenseful fear fall guy 1982 we live in interesting exciting and anxious times I fucking love this kind of shit. The future, visions of the future, dueling visions of the future, sci-fi, world building, the bombast. I love big movies designed for big fucking screens that make you feel like a little ape gawking at flickering images in a dank, dangerous cave that pull you through time and space like some horrid, spectacular dream. If you're like me and in the grip of Coppola mania and totally gooning for anything, all things Megalopolis, you have probably seen or read that this film, H.G. Wells's Things to Come, was both formative to a young FFC and inspirational for his upcoming fable. We'll fight him. Since Gordon got away, I've had some of those air chaps up to see me. Only a few minutes into this semi-episodic dialogue, of and for the future, and and while watching Alone at Home, I can see how this was, and still is, (laughs) a dazzling shock to the system. I, I, I can't even fathom what it would have been like to watch this in the theater in 36, just as the world was rapidly positioning for military conflict on the eve of World War II. Even today, I, I don't know how to fully contextualize this. A film that attempts to say that Despite humanity's best possible rational efforts, humanity will be continually drawn down by the petty, manipulative, and jealous. Nevertheless, it still strives for hope. It's just all too bad it's framed from a quasi-fascist perspective. When the space gun is ready. Sometime this year, do you mean? Soon. I give Things to Come four stars. Well, they're rotting. It's barbarism come back again. Part of my understanding from gleaning a little bit pre-watch, this is in some regard a response to Fritz Lang's Metropolis from 1927. And whether it's intentional or not, these films are absolutely <laughs> in dialogue with one another. Where like Metropolis envisions a scientific utopia that enslaves humanity, only to be toppled by the individual hero, leader. Things to Come presents an engineering future with total lack of want corrupted by those who attempt to tear the whole thing down merely out of privileged pettiness? I don't know if it's entirely self-coherent, but there is definitely a reading where a future that does not enrich the entire human experience for as many people as possible is doomed to failure. 2036 AD, you are catapulted through the centuries, world into the great unknown, into an era of glass cities towering to the sun, and a gigantic space gun rocketing passengers to the moon. Everything about this film is stunning to behold. This is a film cinema was born to create. Actors, Loomis Titans, the sets and visual effects spared no expense. Menzies experience as a production designer fits hand in glove with themes of engineering and architecture being the seeds of tomorrow. Shout out to Laszlo Mahalinaj. If this is the bedrock on which humanist Coppola is building his vision of the struggle for the future, I'm excited to see him continue the conversation. I need to see this in a theater the first chance I get. Why don't you just go home? I've been asking myself that one all night long. So what happened? Why can't you? 
I was, I was ready to love this, but why? I mean, I get it, but why is this guy such a jerk? Let me back up. Martin Scorsese directed the shit out of this. The camera, the lighting, the editing, the staging, the location work, the music, the performances, most of the performances. I just didn't, I couldn't connect. So I left. I don't buy characters needing to be likable in order to connect with an audience. I just think they need a coherent or poetically or interestingly misaligned worldview. With this, Griffin Dunn as Paul Hackett is triangulated somewhere within lovable buffoon, clueless yuppie, and wayward secret romantic. Never really lands on any one of them. I just kept wondering why this totally likable guy kept acting like such a jerk. I couldn't believe that! I give After Hours 3.75 stars. I think what it is, is that it's sort of a burgeoning version of what would later become Gen X nihilist cinema. Maybe that's harsh. Every last woman in this film is, is giving a remarkable memorable performance truly exceptional to behold and i just i they were all wasted on paul i i, I think i'm just jealous and now i gotta die for it you know what do you want from me what have i done i'm just a word processor damn it is that all they i can see how this film works for so many of my friends in scorsese nutcases is that unbelievable or what maybe at 43 it's it's too late in life for me, for this film, for to connect. I don't know. I, I, I haven't found a way in yet. I don't know. Where is the Prince of Wales? We do not know, my lord. I can't possibly fathom what would attract Orson Welles to such a character, such a tragedy of personal and institutional betrayal, to such a writer. To have the confidence to conglomerate a character from fucking Shakespeare into a coherent film, a thrilling film. Misleader of you! I mean, is this guy underrated? Kai Jack 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 This is a beautiful film. Wells in maximalist black and white might be unmatched. I somehow constantly forget how effortlessly this motherfucker combines the classical and the avant-garde. I mean, and also the battle sequence in this goes pretty fucking hard. I give Chimes at Midnight four stars. I feel that George R. R. Martin must have seen this. I feel like Terry Gilliam would have loved to have made Holy Grail more like this if you were given the chance to direct. If you're not familiar with Wells, but you're a throne head and appreciate some Coen brothers, this is well worth a watch. I'm underselling it. It's dope ass dialogue, bombastic and expressionally grounded performances, unmatched aesthetic sensibility, and a gut-wrenching story. What, like, what more do you want? Jack! I speak to me, my heart. It's a little light on Hanky Panky. I came here specifically for this sequence, this song and dance sequence. Hey, Pops, keep that beat a beat. I feel a rhythmic brainstorm coming on. I thought, hopefully, foolishly, <laughs> that this, these performers, Whitney's Lindy Hoppers, aka the Harlem Kangaroo dancers, were the entirety of the film. <laughs> a man can dream. Right off the rip, I'm not gonna pretend like I knew who any of these people were or even knew that this film existed until about a year ago, two years ago, yesterday. It was a film I added to my watch list at some while back, buried way back down the list until I saw like a three second clip on Instagram and knew I had to grab it immediately. But yeah, I spent a good chunk of the beginning part of the movie wondering if A, I had the right movie, 
B, okay, I see what's going on. When are we going to get to it? And, and then C, what the fuck am I watching? This film is fucking bananas. Well, before Charlie Kaufman broke adaptation, this film is a film about a film about a film about trying to trying to bring a successful musical from the stage to the screen. It's a Marx Brothers adjacent, Astaire and Rogers democratized, heavily seasoned with Looney Tunes. I couldn't get enough of it and until I started to get enough of it. But but then the Lindy Hoppers exploded me out of my hypnotic state and surpassed all my expectations. I give Hells a Pop in 3.75 stars. The whole how do we make this crazy film within a film conceit thankfully eases off its own cleverness to actually suck me into the story. But it's just enough story to link song and dance set pieces together. You're really here for the cleverness of the set pieces and the cleverness. You're really here for the cleverness and the performances. And it serves a near perfect amount. Thank you so much, Swing Cat VB, for putting this together. Thank you so much to Eric Weinstein for hipping me to this. So funny that it took him insisting to Joe Rogan on a podcast that I found this incredible corner of, of cinema slash history. This film broke every bone in my body, including my heart. Incredible. Truly incredible. I should go back to school and learn more descriptors. What, what are the words? I, I should learn more words, ju just so I can describe how much I love this film. With this, Fukusaku has rocketed into my personal canon. <laughs> he confirms what I've long suspected, that action filmmakers are, are just the fucking best. They know how to tell coherent visual narratives. They can make things exciting, tense, horrific, often comedic. They have to deliver visceral emotional response. And when you couple that with a mind and heart like Fukusaku, someone who appreciates genre for what it is, without ego, but studied and pursued with intense interest. I have not been more taken by a film since, I, I don't know, Carnet's Port of Shadows, or Claire's Anuse la Liberté. I totally fucked up. Or Singing in the Rain, really. I give Fall Guy five stars. This is a movie about movies that actually delivers on being a movie about movies. With one of the most miraculous scenes of desperation ever put on screen. I can't say enough about Keiko Matsuzaka and Mitsuru Hirata. This is only his third film as an actor? What? <laughs> Matsuzaka does that amazing feat of embodying and playing a stunning star and also the most naked, humble transformation to selflessness. She's incredible. Incredible. I'm going back to school. Hirata not only hits his stunts and supplication with ferocity, he gives one of the most human performances I've ever seen. This belongs in the conversation with Day for Night, The Player, all that jazz, Sherlock Jr. A film like this needs a filmmaker like Fukusaku to bring honest, satisfying brutality to the whole modern romantic comedic affair. Right of the park. 
This week, my weekly pick of the week is undoubtedly, absolutely, obviously, Fall Guy. This film is great at home, but I can't imagine the pop with an audience. Watch it with someone you love. My B pick of the week is Things to Come. The new Megalopolis trailer that just dropped and the Cannes film Twitter is going insane. I can already see many, many interesting connections. Thank you so much for watching. You can follow me on Instagram and X to see what movies I'm renting next. And pretty much everything is on my letterbox. Uh, I am going to go watch some more movies. I hope you do too.